what I tend to do is I divide weeds up into different groups. So it's not just the green and you go, oh, where do I start? So the first group of weeds are those ones I was talking about that just blow in and blow out and they don't hang around and they're basically mainly disturbance regenerated and I call them ubiquitous weeds. So there are you. So I'll have all my weeds on a weed list, then I'll go through and then I'll prioritise them. So anything that's like, not so much Vorpia, which is a little grass, because it can be a bit allopathic, but all the other ones are basically um, some of the annuals, mm -hmm. some of the things that are just blowing out, some of the thistles. They're a big agricultural problem, but they're not actually huge in the way of things. Um, so they're, they're scattered weeds of disturbed areas, and they're mainly from the daisy family and, and some of the annual grasses. Um, they're a low priority, except in high quality retention areas. So if you've got an area that's got um, endangered orchids and a moss layer, and it, the only problem is the grassy weeds in there, then you'd deal with them. Otherwise, along the edge of the path or something where they often are, you just um, use selective brush cutting prior to seed set over time and that would probably reduce them. But they're always going to be there because people are walking through them all the time. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, um, and things are disturbed and people mm -hmm. walk with dogs and then there's dog shit and, you know, it's got nutrient. <laughs> it's often got um, granite paths which add phosphate to the soil which help weeds because most of our, our local plants don't like them. So, um, so it's the lowest priority except in the high quality retention areas. And um, the measure of success is the, um, the highest quality and threatened species sites of maintained weed free. And, um, and then the, what I've got is another column, work plans needs. So I've divided up into the type of weed what the characteristic is of it, um, management strategy with it, um, examples of it, and some of these, I apologise, are probably more from the peninsula, but you have a lot of similar things here. Um, the priority, the measure of success, and what your work plan needs to make it a success. So the ubiquitous weeds, um, you know, with someone like that, you need to be able to have be, ident be able to identify seedlings. So you need a fairly skilled person working in those high quality sites, which you would anyway, because you've got endangered species and you don't want someone treading on them and you want to minimise disturbance and you want to walk really gently and not wear heavy wear boots and wear your soft slippers. And you need a calendar of works based on the understanding of what species are going to come up. Mm. And we'll go into the methodology later. Uh, the other group of weeds that I'll talk about is um, keystone weeds. So keystone weeds, they've been there a long time. They may have totally dominated. They're not going to get any worse. <laughs> you know, they've probably got to their worst. And um, it's going to take a long time to move them out over time. And you don't want to do it fast because if you took all the polygala out of Point Nepean tomorrow, you'd lose the bandicoots and you'd lose the leafy greenwoods. When they've taken over cleared polygala of leafy greenwood sites, we've lost them because the sun beats down. We've got climate change, you know, we don't know. <coughs> a keystone weed is one that if you remove it, you're taking out a keystone. Mm. Everything's adapted to it. It's been there for 150 years. Um, things have adapted to being there Things are surviving, those orchids under there are surviving and those bandicoots are surviving partly because it's there, because mm. it's been there a long time. So you need, and it's like um, what I was saying about the double barred finches and the diamond firetails, they're reliant now on the briar rose, not so much the serrated tussock, they probably use another grass. But so they that could be the large pine that feeds the black cockatoos when they come across? Or, um, to yeah. a certain extent, although um, if yellow-tailed black cockatoos eat too much pine, they don't eat um, longicorn beetle larvae and they need a meat source to be able to breed. Oh. So it's like lolly food. Oh. <laughs> um, I'd say more Jungle. for the perch, for the um, black-shouldered kites on Tookarook Swamp. 
that's where the pine, the cypresses come in there. They seem to need that perch. Um, but yeah, yellow tailed black coffee. There's too many pine trees, it's just lolly food. Uh, but if it's the only one around, there's worse weeds, you know, than that. So, and it's amazing how much pine trees protect the seed bank under the soil. So I took out a group of pine trees up on, or organised it to be taken out, up on Red Hill on a property for the Macmillans, and they, they were planning to plant. And I said, no, no, we're not planting. We're not planting for at least two years. And they said, but we're getting old. We want to see an instant thing. And I'm going, well, planting's not it, you know, because they don't put their roots down. Things that come up by themselves grow so much quicker and better. So they, um, they took the pines out. They didn't have to plant one thing. Mm. The amount of restoration that came back was enormous, mm. like from grasses through to trees to shrubs. That that's, a seed bank underneath a pine tree is often, if it's only been put in once and not ploughed twice and had three generations of pine trees, then there's generally a seed bank under there. Mm. And you just need to wait. You don't need to plant it. You just need to wait. Because often when you plant it, then they go around spraying around the plants, mm. all the natural region, mm. you know? That becomes the focus. Mm. So we're starting to set up the Australian Association of Bush Regenerators in Victoria, which hasn't been, it's been going in New South Wales for about 15 years, but it's very much a allow for natural restoration before you just go in and, and plant. Um, so mm. keystone species, they're historically been there a long time. They dominate both structurally and floristically. That means they t they've changed the structure and they dominate in terms of how many different types of plants and what area they are, so floristically. It has the potential to, it's, it's got potentially habitat, high habitat values for indigenous species and it may also be um, protecting seed banks. Um, so the management strategy is to work <coughs> slowly and systematically from high quality areas out and don't bite off more than you can chew. Um, maintain habitat and buffer areas. So, and you remove the fruiting individuals first. So if you've got something that's got um, both genders, you take out the females first. Potosporum sort of has a bit of that going, but it can change gender, so don't be tricked. So, um, and usually, instead of it being a dot, it's a polygon yeah. that you're looking at. And so, um, you, you're trying to move from those high quality areas on the understanding that that's where the seed bank, the fungi, and all the biodiversity is, and you're moving it slowly out. And then it becomes more resistant to weed invasion, and you, you're expanding on it. And then if you've got a whole lot of islands, you're trying to join them up. Yeah. And that actually works in a fragmented landscape, and I've seen that happen a few times. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then the um, priority... Oh, some examples of that is like the, um, the polygala at Point Nepean mm -hmm. that dominates the potosperm on some of your reserves here. Mm -hmm. Although part of me goes, hmm... It's sometimes it's with um, Clematis glycinoides, which makes me wonder if it's actually part of the um, Streslecki population. Because that's close, and this is an old river system. So part of me, even on some parts of the, on French Island over on Blue Gum Point, it's grown with Zyeria, which is a Gippsland plant, and you've got Zyeria mm. on the island. Mm. And so some of me thinks, well, is it a weed here? I don't know. I mean, Leon Costerman mm. says that the Grantville population is not indigenous. I mean, maybe we need to be looking at some genetics here. Mm. And because um, apparently the one they pl they they planted a lot of natives back in the 1860s, not the 1960s, the 1860s. So a lot of it comes back to there. They brought in golden wattle and put it across the whole of southern Victoria after they mm. nearly wiped out black wattle, t using it for the tanning mm. skins. That was the second biggest export crop in Australia at the time. So they had a big inquiry and they planted golden wattle on French Island. They probably planted it here. And they planted it on every crown land and reserve across southern Victoria. So 
Um, and then they found out it was crap for tanning skin, so they just oh. left it there. Oh. <laughs> so it's, it's nice to know the it's good to know the history sometimes. Mm. So, but that's become a keystone on French Island. So you wouldn't want to go and just take it all out because it's been there for 120 years. Mm. So the strategy's been where there's patches of black water, we move it out from that. And the same on Arthur's seat. We've got on the front of Arthur's seat down at Anthony's nose. It's on the Brighton Dunes. It's right across the Ballerine. It doesn't belong. People keep planting it because they think it belongs. So that's good to be aware of that. Um, and the priority is long-term management required, considered by control. There's biocontrol agents now coming in for boxthorn, spurge, um, tradescantia. Um, and the measure of success is that the percentage of the population contained, no proper gills produced, um, males or young still present, or percentage of area eliminated, some seed in regeneration, or percentage of area eliminated, no or little seedling regeneration, that would be over time. So you containment first and then working towards elimination. So the work plan for that needs a vegetation quality mapping overlay or some sort of idea of where the quality areas are um, and overlaid with the weed distribution map to help prioritise the site. Needs a calendar of works based on the species life cycle and um, when it's going to be most effective. And, and also how much skills and resources you've got. That'll sort of make, mix that around a bit. And, um, and you need skilled supervision for the high quality areas. But in other areas, that's something where you can send in schools or a friend's group if it's just one particular plant and that's what they're IDing and you're not in a high quality area. So that's one place. So that's how you can actually work out where you're gonna put which resources um, based on that. Um, so that's those two groups of weeds. Then the next group of weeds is what I call the small patch weeds. So the small patch weeds, uh, they're a variable risk but they're the easiest to actually eliminate because I've only just got there like last week or not long ago. They haven't had time to put down a seed bank because with some of these plants, like something like gauze, the seed bank can last for well, till the time there's an expire. I mean, it might last hundreds of years. Who knows? We haven't been around long <coughs> enough to test that. At the moment, they're at 20, but that's probably only because they've been looking at it for 20 years. So, but you, they're a hard, waxy seed coat. And I know with some wattles, they're similar, and they can last hundreds of years in some places if they're not disturbed because mm -hmm. they've got such a seed, heavy seed coat. Mm -hmm. So then it becomes, how do I stimulate that weed to all come up so I can get rid of it out of the seed bank? So we'll discuss that. <coughs> so the small patch weeds, they're, um, the, they're a variable risk. So the highest risk in the small patch weeds are the ones that um, are known to, have a, to be a high risk because we've seen it in every other reserve in the state and they're on the list of high risk, very high risk weeds in what's called the WESI list, which I'll get to. Um, they've, you, they haven't been here long. Um, the worst ones are the ones that genetically pollute because that's really insidious and I don't think it's given enough attention. You know, we could lose the native pig face really easily in this state. Um, you know, there's whole areas now where there's none of it and it's really worrying. It's not just a problem here, it's a problem in Chile, it's probably a problem in Africa. You know, there's African ones and Chilean ones and Mexican ones and Australian ones. And they're all sort of mixing it up. And the local one's so tasty, it'd be such a shame to lose it, you know. So, um, and we'll talk about that because there's some over here we can look at. Um, so they're the highest priority for me, the ones that hybridise and collect gene pools. Because once that happens, like mahogany gums and manna gums, I mean, do the koalas eat them? I don't know. They eat manigans. I don't know they if they eat mahoganies. Yeah, well, mm. all the, the hybrids look like mahoganies. Mm. But then it's ethnic cleansing, isn't it? Mm. Because you don't exactly. know that just because that one looks more like a manigum, 
it, all its other genes, other than what it looks like, might be mahogany mm. genes. Mm. It's like ethnic cleansing. It becomes really difficult. So it's good if you don't <coughs> sort of have it to start with. So um, before they did a fire in the Balcom Estuary, I advised getting rid of all the mahoganies beforehand, for two years beforehand, so that when they actually um, did the fire, then hopefully what came up was managuns, but they didn't. And all of them that came up are mahoganies, and now they've got a really hard decision oh, to make. Okay. So be aware of genetic pollution. Um, Malaleuca armillaris, I think we've got one over yeah. here somewhere. That crosses with um, swamp paper bark. Mm. Some of the wattles, I don't know if you've ever seen a um, cootamundra wattle, cross with a back wattle, doesn't look like either of them. Um, there is natural hybridisation, but just be aware that hybridisation is something that hasn't really been looked at enough and I think mm. it needs more looking at. So the next status are weeds that are known to be difficult to eradicate once established. Um, I'm sure you've had experience with things like um, sour salt, like that some of these things are really hard to get rid of. You know, gladiolus is really hard to get rid of. It's on the drains at Sunderland Bay. Um, Polygala. is not so bad, hard to not get so rid bad. of. Oh. We'll discuss that. Margaret won't agree. Well, I've, I've got rid of acres of polygala, so um, I can give you some good ideas on that. Um, and so, they're the, and, and things that go long distance, like um, particularly if there's blackbirds around, mm -hmm. once you start, we didn't have a problem, at, at, at Point in the Pan, they concentrate on the polygala instead of on the Italian buckthorn. And Italian buckthorn's got red berries. Oh. It's incredibly hard to get rid of. Oh. It's um, the roots, like everything's really hard about it. Um, and they, so they let that go. It's now coming up through the polygala. And now, because it's got berries, the blackbirds have moved in. So now we're getting ivy, cotoneaster, mm -hmm. all the other lolly berry foods. <coughs> um, you know, like all these things are coming in that we didn't have an issue with before. So um, polygala in Africa, um, oh, I'll go into polygala later when we do methods. Um, so that's sort of the next layer of weeds. And polygala probably would be in that too. It's just that I've had experience with Italian bucks on, so that's why I think it's worse. For ages, it was polygala was worse. <laughs> it's like I used to think spear thistles were worse than ox tongue. But they're very sort of human values often, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and where the thing looks nice is often a thing <laughs> for some people. It depends um, on the problem it's causing too, I suppose. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, it does. Mm -hmm. Does it dominate? Mm -hmm. Is it allopathic? Does it have habitat value? Mm. All those questions. And when they do the risk matrix for under the WESI thing, the weeds, environmental, you know, they're, the, they're the sort of new and invading weeds. When they do the risk matrix for every weed and they go through how far it's going to go and how far it has gone and all that, they're looking at those things, pollination mechanisms, ability, um, numbers of ways of dispersing, um, you know, ability to, disperse, ability to invade in how many different ecosystems, which may change over time as we learn about it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they've got it, it's actually a structure they've set up that they go through to work out those risk ratings. Um, so then the next ones are, are, well, weeds that are directly hazardous to wildlife, like mm -hmm. the ox tongue. Mm -hmm. So that'd be the cruel vine that's directly hazardous to moths. <laughs> You know, like there's some things that are directly hazardous. Um, then there's the, so that's, they're all high, but then you get down to um, weeds that spread vegetatively and don't have any seed and just go slowly. Like kakuyu. Kakuyu. Kakuyu um, only has the male flowers in Australia. There's no female, so there's no seed produced. So it's one plant all over Australia. Probably the same with bracken. You know, I think bracken does the same thing. So some of, some of the succulents, um, and I used to put pig face in that, the carpobrotuses, till I knew that, found out they hybridised. Mm. So that was in the S2s. So they're things that you go, okay, it's in that patch, but 
it's only going to go slowly. We'll work on that later. Okay. And then the S3s are low. I mean, you can change this around to whatever you want. You can have an X, S, asterisk, star going. These are the worst. You know, you can move them around a little bit. Um, and it's going to be different in different places and depending on the vegetation communities you've got too. Mm. So, and the low ones are ones like the flowering gum that you might see one one um, seedling come up in a hundred years and the possum lives in <coughs> at the front of the reserve and you're not going to worry about it. Um, so that's just a way of grouping them. Now with the S1 small patch high risk weeds, that's the highest priority eliminated across the site and it includes all the new and emerging weeds. And you can look at that at the layer of your reserve, or you can look at that at the layer of the island, or you can look at that at the layer of the state, mm. you know. Mm. So at the, at, the layer, uh, at the layer of the island, oh no, first um, So that's your weed species prioritisation, mm. okay? So, site prioritisation. Now, this is a map I did of um, a section of Seaford Foreshore. This is in 1992 and this is in 2009. This is before they started spraying the Smilax. It's gone backwards. Uh, ironically, I mapped, there's 32 um, tracks that go from the Seaford, from Keys Park to Frankston, that go across the foreshore. So I mapped them in blocks and from the primary dune to the top of the primary dune, from there to the north-south track and from the north-south track to the road. So I divided each exclosure into um, three zones. So I mapped all that and then I mapped the veg. This is before having it on your phone. Mm. I think I was a bit insane. Anyway, <laughs> um, so the red is the lowest quality, like it's basically crap. Here I've called it less than 25% and um, in ditch cover. And the green's good, it's great, that's greater than 75%. And the blue is 50 to 75, and the yellow's 25 to 50. I should have known that without even needing my glasses. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see that over time, there's actually been improvement. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. significant difference. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Now, I was interested in mm -hmm. um, this little patch here that's red, that there's green. Mm -hmm. And I went back to my original maps, and the original maps had this is all as marron grass. Mm. But I had noted in my little hand-drawn thing three, three little bees, which meant Banksia seedlings, wow. in amongst the marron. So when I went back in 2009, that's 1992, that's 2009, it's good to have baseline because then you can measure it from, because you forget, you know, you go, oh, I don't Good yeah. documentation too. Yeah, 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 and it makes it easier to document. Um, and then, so what happened is these three little banksies had come up, and in had come a bird with some sea berry salt bush seed, and then the um, the um, coast daisy bush had blown into there. So now it's smothered. The marum's gone, and it's banksia, regodia, and coast daisy bush. So it's interesting over time. What's happened? So now you'll also notice that. Oh, sorry. So the, the marrow wasn't actually removed. No. Oh. No, it it's, um, it's a bit risky it. removing marrow unless it's in a patch of spinifex and you've got something I mean, immediately to take it over. over. Yeah. So or if you've got some knobby club sedge mm. moving this way or some clematis, you might consider taking mm. it out. But given that we're in a time of coastal things, you know, I see it as a nursery to plant into. I mean, I'd get the, I'd get the Banksy cones and fling them in. I'm a bit of a direct seeder. <laughs> oh, well, I'm a lazy gardener. <laughs> well, uh, it's not gardening what we're doing. In fact, we're fixing up the garden, aren't we? Yeah, that's right. So, you'll notice that there's always going to be a red line along the track, you know, because that's, that's yeah. the north-south track, yeah. and along these tracks going across. Yeah. Um, the top, the front bit improved when they took the box thorn out. They didn't bulldoze it like they did up at opposite Surf Beach up there, which I was a bit worried about because there's midden sites in there. But um, 
Oh. They um, cut and painted it. Well, you use a pole saw and you get in with your long arm to call them. It's, it's, it's a really hazardous plant, box thorn. Mm. Um, don't get spikes in you. If you get into a joint, it can give you arthritic septicemia. Oh, and nice. I got my Borrelia ulcer from a box thorn spike oh. or a mosquito. And it was, it was in a drain and I was doing rabbit monitoring. I know exactly the time oh, because nice. I did the waypoint and then I pulled the piece of box thorn off my ankle oh. and then off my ear. Um, so just be really aware it's a hazardous plant. They're not all African box thorns. I've found two other species on the morning peninsula. Mm -hmm. So it's, that was interesting. I think one of them might be Chinese mm -hmm. because no one in Africa knew what it was. And I said, send it to the Chinese because oh. goji berry, that's a box thorn. Oh. And if you're allergic to solanaceae, avoid it. It's not a power food. <laughs> oh. so, um, so that all went green after they did that. So. After they removed the box on, all this kangaroo apple came up. Oh, great. Well, where did it, there wasn't any previously on the foreshore. It must have, it can sit under the soil for a long time. Mm. And box thorn and, and the salama are in the same family. Yeah. They're all solanaceae. And I remember when I first knew um, Keith, there were some trials that were done in the Rocky Valley Dam up at Falls Creek where we got the um, compost from because the borrow pits were all bare and there was no topsoil so the idea was um, go to Mount Beauty get the bottom of the sewage pits take it up there put it on the ground millions of tomatoes came up <laughs> you remember that? so um, and along here this was pretty much a do nothing approach other than taking out the obvious weeds Mm -hmm. um, what happened was the bower spinach grew up and just covered and smothered out a whole heap of stuff. The curly leaf spiders and the orb weavers moved in so no, no one wanted to walk through there because mm -hmm. so they stayed out of there with their dogs and they couldn't get in there anymore because that had all grown over. And um, you know it started to mm -hmm. improve in quality just by itself mm -hmm. without having and, and there is a lot to be said with the do nothing approach with some things. Yeah. Um, just, you know, too, yeah. sometimes too much management is a threatening process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and with weeds, the main thing is probably to look at what the threatening processes are, which is mm -hmm. part of why is it here. I mean, maybe that's there, those weeds are there because that's where that drain's been put and it's all that nutrient mm -hmm. and, you know, you can spend your life trying to fix that up, but maybe it's better turned into a swale and change the configuration mm -hmm. yeah. or something. Mm -hmm. um, or did that drain need to be there in the first place? Mm -hmm. So looking at the threatening processes on um, mm -hmm. Sunland Bay surf beach, like on a lot of the island, the rabbits mm -hmm. are the threatening process. Mm -hmm. And in some areas, maybe brush-tailed possums with the trees. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. looking at threatening processes and trying to do something about them is a good way of reducing that mm -hmm. um, pressure for the, um, well, the benefit for weeds, you know, the favouring mm -hmm. for them all the time. Um, now, when, you, when you've got your site thing like this and you're working out where you're going to put your energy, you're not <coughs> going to put it in the red areas along the tracks. You're going to sort of go, oh, look, maybe we should... There's a green area that's really good with a bl surrounded with blue and it's just got this little bit of yellow and red there. Maybe we should join that up. Mm. And when you look at that, mm. that's what's yes, happened. Exactly. So then you go, oh, well, we're not going to put all our energy, this is a track here and it's red, so um, we're not going to put our energy there, we'll put it there and join these bits up. So it enables you to, because there's a tendency to walk in the reserve and do the first thing you see, <laughs> instead of going, oh no, we've got to go right over there to that really good patch and move out. And we'll see what we see on the way and pick it on the way. And we'll take a different track each time. So we're picking different things on the way because it's addictive, isn't it? You can't help yourself. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I mean, we walked along the Yarra River at one time. We were trying to stop the bike path being put through all the rare plants. And we were walking through, we were pretending we didn't know each other. Mm. We were walking through um, all these different areas in different contours up the edge of the Yarra. And after about six months, it was fantastic. <laughs> because we were just taking out two weeds a day or something, you know, and it, it builds up. Yeah. And you'd yeah. see that with the coastal spurge. The areas that have been cleared are really obvious and the ones that aren't are really obvious. Yeah. Um, 
So that's about site prioritisation. Now, what I've discovered, though, is in some areas where you go, oh, there's less than 75% weeds, sometimes they're the mulched garden beds because mm. there's no weeds and they're sprayed. But that's not actually the areas where the greatest biodiversity is or mm. where what's called the greatest resilience is mm. and where the source of um, seed and stuff for the future comes in. So I've sort of change that from just being percentage cover and looked at it more from a biodiversity viewpoint mm -hmm. which means like are all the layers there, is there moss layers? That's a very important thing because ultimately um, you know like we can measure biodiversity in terms of how many possums or whatever we haven't even got to walk in yet <laughs> how many possums or whatever but they're, they're big things but most of the biodiversity is in the, the top layers of the soil. Mm -hmm. And actually they're finding that the further they go down, the more stuff they're finding, and that there's actually more underneath the ground than there is on top of the ground. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have a tendency to just look across and not think about what's underneath. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, some of us might start looking at soil type to work out veg communities or whatever, but, you know, generally that stuff gets left out. And people come in, they might see kikuya, but they might not see that there's a seed bank under it. Mm. Or, um, you know, like, so, and it's hard to know. It? How do you approach yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, well, you've got kikuya and you've got a seed bank. Well, if the kikuya is around an ancient tree, mm. which I think there is some dirt down there, mm. um, and, I mean, I had this at Kingston the other day. There was only two patches of kikuya on the reserve. One was over near the front gate, and it was like, well, we'll mow that. Mm. But one was under an ancient swamp gum, mm. and it was like, well, we'll do with this. So with kikuya, because it doesn't produce any seed, mm. um, you have to choose a time when it's actively growing. So traditionally that was actively growing in summer, mm -hmm. but actually in winter it's actively growing under the ground. Mm. So if you go to those places, you know, when someone's dumped a big pile of mulch, and all and and all the kikuyu's grown over it. Yeah. It loves it, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. You know. Um, so, but if you go to that in winter, it's putting huge amount of activity under the ground. Yeah. So it is still quite active. It's just that the aerial stuff's not got as much absorption. So, but I use um, one to five hundred glyphosate. One to five hundred. One to one hundred just hits the top off. Now. Um, so, um, but, I mean, I try to avoid her herbicides. Yeah. The other way Me you could too. deal with that is solarisation, which I've got all this stuff yes. in the car over there. And that doesn't kill the seeds under the ground? The no, it won't kill the seeds under the ground, no. Right, so oh, the seed bank. it without The seed harming. bank's still there. Right, okay. Now, interestingly, though, with Kikuya, down on um, Germana Forshaw on Anthony's Nose, between Germana and McRae, that was all kikuya there. It used to be a camping ground and then they stopped it because a few kids got hit on the road on that dangerous bend. Um, so they, um, they were mowing it. It was taking half their budget yeah. mowing this kikuya, yeah. you know. Yeah. I said, why are you mowing it? And they said, oh, because it's going to go further and go up into there. I go, no, it won't. It's too shady. Kikuya hates shade. Like the shades, no? So in a grassland it's a problem, but in swamp scrub it's not. You just make it denser <laughs> and it won't like it. And it's not going to spread from seed. So, um, so you can either cover it with black plastic and solarise it for a year. Put, um, you need to make sure you go about this far out from where the grass finishes because it goes like that underneath. Um, cover it like that and then after a year take it off. Um, and that may seem to be um, a big thing to do. I mean, but we do have time and it's good to go slowly. You cover it with, you'd have to hold it down with old tyres. If it's in a public spot, you put mulch on top of it mm. and peg it down or something. You don't want to peg it at, in the middle because you'll get holes and it'll grow up through the holes. So you want something that's fairly intact. But I have used solarisation on a lot of different things and um, it works quite well. But with the herbicide, one to 500, for some of those rhizomic things, weak solution works better than the straight solution, you know, the normal standard. Yeah. And they only found that out by mistake because, well, I only found out by mistake. But the first time I heard about it, David Stewart at Franks and Cancel came back in the office and went, oh, damn, 
I calibrate it wrong. Oh no, I spent all day <laughs> doing that thing. It's not going to work. And he went back and went, oh, worked better than it did before. It just took longer. Oh. It was slower. The plant went, oh, it's water and sucked it in. Oh. It didn't just go, ah, and cut off the circulation. Yeah. So, um, and then the next time I worked it out was I'd had this patch of cooch down near the side of the fence. It came in for the neighbours. And I had my spray thing, which I told, you know, it's very rare for me to spray anything. And, um, and so I'm like, what am I going to do with this? And I, so I diluted it. I put, had the container, I put water in it, I washed it down. And I sprayed that on the cooch. Well, it died. Because it was just the, the weak solution. 1 to 500, much better for the ground too, isn't it? Yeah, and you can mix it with a bit of something like molasses and that helps with the bacteria and the carbon. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I have used solarisation. I'll talk about that when we get down to car for a lot of different things. Can I um, ask a quick yes. question? Yes. In, in silver leaves, yeah. we've got like thistles and lots of things that are invading around the, the tea trees area. To mulch there, is that, instead of spraying, is that going to help? Don't, I don't not? like bringing in mulch. Yep. Um, they brought in all the European millipedes. Um, with mulch into Wilson's Prom of the Portuguese millipedes yes. and they've brought in mulch to um, an area where the sunshine diuris is and they've now got really major slug issues. Um, of, often under tea tree. Um, so it's a nat natural swampy wetland area? Oh, are you talking about um, swamp paper bark or coast tea tree? <coughs> Oh, swamp, swamp paper bark. Yep, okay. Sorry. So underneath swamp paper bark, um, it's more about the thistles are only there because it's open and there's not much else. Yep. So um, it's probably missing senecios. It's probably missing that bluish poa that grows under the swamp scrub around here. And it's probably missing a lot of the succulents. Like it often gets a lot of bow spinach and seaberry salt fish under the swamp scrub around here. Yep and some of those things. So it's just that it's a dare, dare, uh, bare area. So and probably what those. happened was is there was a whole lot of thistles there in the past and they kept spraying it and knocked off everything else. Mm. Mm. Potentially? It's Potentially. It yeah, so if we reintroduce those and just oh, have time. I'd, I'd wait and see if they come up. Yep. Um, and then when I reintroduce stuff, like they came into the Franks and Spider Orchid site, some contractors and took out the black trio, thinking they were pine trees. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I, I spent, every time I walked into the reserve, I grabbed some cones and I just go clean. Well, I went there last time, there's six come up. And they've come up exactly where they want to be. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So um, if you, I'm more likely to go in and see. Yeah. I mean, not if it's something rare, like you've got over in the swamp scrub at Rill, you've got that Monotopa Gorka, which is a rare plant. And there's not many plants of it. So you wouldn't go necessarily direct sow in that. That's something you might try and grow on because there's not many seeds available. But for something that's around, I think what's actually, and I think what's actually depleted on Phillip Island is the she-oaks. Mm. The she-oaks were all chopped down for lime kilns. Yep. The she-oaks are really important for ground mammals, the fungi, the yep. truffles. She-oaks produce haemoglobin to feed mm. their bacteria. They're quite an amazing plant and um, they're in major decline across a lot of southern Victoria. They were first chopped down in 1830s for fodder. Um, there was a fellow who was walking his horse and they were dying of thirst and they came up this hill and there was a grove of shayok and the horse started voraciously eating it. And then, he, and there was these big groves. This is on the Western Plains, and I did the Western Grassland Survey in 1982 yeah. with John Stevie. So um, there were whole groves, and then he came back a year later, and there were none of the groves left. That's in 1839. Yeah. So, um, and you might have thought you were in the Simpson Desert, yeah. but it was Western Victoria in July. And that was the year that I think Gips went across the Snowy River because normally you couldn't get across it. Yeah. You probably can these days, but I've tried once. Um, but you couldn't get across it, but that year was the drought. So that year he, Gips got across to do Gippsland, you know. So um, it's, it's interesting. I, I, I think that there are... 
one of the keystones, the indigenous keystones that's missing mm. out of here, mm. is the she oaks. Mm. And because I don't know if you've ever tasted them, we'll taste them. Um, I've got my living culture. I'm not. I'm not indigenous. I'm. A, I'm related to John MacArthur. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a MacArthur steward. And the Earls of Desmond, which probably everybody comes from them, from the Munster Uprising of 1600s. I've even met Aboriginal people who come from them. <laughs> so um, I'm just paying off sheep karma, I think. Um, You're doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> well, my lifeline and my work line are the same. Oh, it shows. You know. um, so then... Um, then it, yeah, I've just sort of discussed managing the threatening processes, but there's a number of threatening processes. So it might be some of the feral animals, it might be um, dump, rubbish dumping. Mm. You've got a big garden waste issue, you know, from people dumping their succulents over the fence, or mm. like a lot of linear coastal reserves. Um, you've got, so, so if you can manage some of those, drainage, hydrology, we can manage those. We can't manage climate change so easily. We're all trying, and we wish the governments had listened. But, um, you know, that's, not, that's something that's harder, but there are some things that we can manage. So rabbits is one thing we can manage. Hydrology, in terms of design, we can manage. Trying to stop more use of aquifers and developers and stuff, being more sensitive design. Um, the, um, but climate change is a bit more difficult. There is a new plan for Western Port that um, some of you crew will know all about, and that's so that it's um, looked at in terms of sustainable development and having one overlay instead of five different people managing it. So that seems to have had um, a pretty good response. Um, there's some, we've made some. West, um, West Port Protection Council's made some movies that are going to be put out as ads. And um, so we've just got to finalise those. But there's quite a bit of stuff going on on that front. Um, but looking at what's creating the problem in the first place, um, you know, and like you can see that what happens with the sand movement, you know, the back and forward. You can see that the coast spurge, if it's there, is going to be up here. You know, like looking at some of those processes that actually create the problem, then we can stop that, then we can start moving forward and start seeing things in their um, systems. So um, I might go over, well there's methods of control, there's con chemical and non-chemical. I'll cover the non-chemical over there at, the, at my van, because I've got all the tools in the car. Um, and oh, and someone, oh, oh, probably Keith will do that, but someone, it's good if someone's a timekeeper because I'm crap at that. And I'm oh, just right, talking well, the time is only about half past 11, isn't it? Oh, geez. Yeah. Okay, well, that's cool. We'll spend the, the last two hours walking around then. Yeah. Mm. yeah. That's great. Might, have have lunch. Lunch. might be time for a little breather. Uh, well, what uh, time's lunch, Keith? We well, I'll just do the two things about chemical time. controls okay. yeah. and then we'll stop because that'll just take. Um, don't do it. Can you control? Don't do it. Oh, look, um, spraying should only ever be as a last resort. Um, uh, apart from something like Kukuya and Cooch, where it's in a situation where, it's, um, where you want actually something to happen, I'd never use it. Ever. I mean, I see a lot of stuff as just chemical control. I see, um, the other day I saw annual grasses that had already gone to seed being sprayed in a patch of Chilean pig face. And I've just seen the thistles sprayed at Kingston Reserve and they've killed all the bow spinach and the seabury salt bush, which was keeping the thistles not there, which was stopping them. Um, you know, like, there's a lot of cowboys around. Having said that, there is some people who are really good with it. And um, you can go and you can't even tell they've really been there. But they know exactly where they're doing it. They're doing it the right time before it's set seed. I see a lot of stuff sprayed after it's already set seed. Well, that's mm. a total waste of time. Mm. And often without the proper PPE and it goes into a drain and it's like, why do you do it? Our roadsides on the morning to show are all sprayed and it's created a whole niche 
for one of the love grasses, Aerogrostis, a really fine one. And it goes all the way from my place to Orbost on the chemical spray line. You know, like they've created the niche for it. And it's fire hazardous, it's this high and dry in summer. And it's like, why are they doing it when they could just slash it? Or they could be using steam in that situation because you're next to a road and you've got the ability to do it. They don't need to be doing all this chemical stuff. No. They need to just keep it for very specific occasions that we need it, just like you keep antibiotics for special situations, because we're getting a lot of resistance. You know, like ryegrass is now resistant. You know, a lot of things are resistant to um, to herbicides because we've overused them, and the plants are going to adapt. So if you keep it minimalist, then it might actually work when you do have to use it. But otherwise. I mean, they, they, gave a, they gave some funding for BlackBerry Control, which all went into spray contractors, for the state at one point. I watched them. They sprayed out the roadside to the Thompson Dam, killed all the tree ferns. Oh. They went through um, the um, Sherbrooke Forest, killed heaps of tree ferns. They went along Gardner's Creek, Sprayed the blackberries, killed all the swamp scrub, didn't kill the blackberries. Oh. Um, went into the back of Green's bush, killed the swamp scrub, didn't kill the blackberries. Mm. We're spraying in the cr Gardener's Creek from the mm. creek bank. Mm. Um, so that was a totally destructive way of yeah. doing it. Yeah. And it and didn't kill them. education for them, like councils educating people that are sent out? Well, I think it, sometimes it comes down to the contract. But they they oh, see it as free contract. funding at the time and it's a reactionary thing. That's why you need to have a management plan and be working towards a plan yes. rather than just a knee-jerk to do, 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 do. Um, you know, and that's why um, having accreditation for the Australian Association of Bush Regenerators, yeah. we're very clear that none of those people are going to be cowboys. Yeah. Mm. It's interesting in the or area cow where I live, mm. when the, con the council had their own con uh, staff, they knew the areas yeah. and you could tell that they avoided, like we've got lots of kangaroo grass near us, but of course they contract it out now and then they're just going for the price they want now. Mm -hmm. Well, and the same thing happened at Sunderland Bay where I mapped all of that coast there and I found one patch of native pig face and all the rest was hybridised or Chilean mm. or um, equilateral, I think it's Chilean. Um, so the contractor came along and sprayed the lot, including the only patch of good stuff. Mm. Mm. And I'd said, well, I'll come down there, Gail knew and she wanted it that way. I mean, she didn't want the spray, mm. but they just did. But um, Gail knew, we, we planned to go there when it was flowering and go to each clump and go, this is the wrong one, take it out. Oh, this is a good one, we'll protect this. Mm. You know, because you've got to count the number of carpools and stuff, and it's quite a specific thing, but, mm. um, you know, unless you've got a good eye for it. So, chemical control involves a lot of things, though. If you're going to go for chemical control, you have to have a... Um, well, it's not just an ACARP, if you're doing it as a contractor, you've got to also have um, a commercial operator licence. You've got to have quite a few different things. Um, it's and not only that, you might be able to use something like diluted glyphosate, but you need to have it stored in the appropriate location and the person who gives it to you has to have these things. So it's quite an involved thing. Um, now, some... Friends groups have got working for Parks or Shire, they're storing it and they're giving them the dabbers, which I'll show you. Um, but quite often they do it with straight herbicide and with dye. And mm. the dye can be as toxic as a herbicide. So, um, you know, I've gone to friends group things that have been like at one of those ones that have been organised by someone else. And um, I've been handed the cake by someone who's got a pink hand. Oh. <laughs> it's got down the back of their pocket where it's leaked. Oh. And, and I'm like, you need to go and get this off you. Yeah. I know, disgusting. So um, you've got, with chemical control, you've got um, permits required, you've got issues with storage, you've got to update your ACARP and, um, you know, there's quite a bit of regulation. So um, that's why I'm here today to try and show you ways of avoiding having to go through all that paperwork.